Well, we're delighted to welcome you all to this latest in our series of Christian Shakespeare. It's been a wonderful series, and this is in many ways a kind of culminating event. Um, we will be beginning with a open a table discussion where we'll bring various of the people who've contributed to the series together. And then after this, we will have um, a lecture given by Baron Williams, who I will introduce later on. I, I don't think you'll need much introduction. I'm sure you all know who he is <laughs> very well. Okay, so delighted to welcome you all. And, uh, and I'm sure this is going to be a wonderful evening of investigating the relationship between Christianity and the writings of Shakespeare. Great. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, those of you who've been, been with us uh, over the last, uh, the last term uh, know uh, more or less about the, uh, about the series and the, aims, and the aims of the series. Let me uh, just introduce the panel. We're, we're a little bit short um, in terms that uh, two of our panel weren't able to, to come tonight. Professor Michael Collins from Georgetown University has been grounded uh, along with everybody else at Georgetown University, um, which has caused us a lot, a lot of difficulties because we had a, uh, a big event supposedly on Tuesday night uh, in London, which, which we had to cancel and the president was coming over. Uh, they all send their apologies from Georgetown uh, that they're not here. Let me just say right from the start, thank you very much to Georgetown University who, who have actually financed the whole of this, this series and also the Future of the Humanities Project. So, uh, let me introduce, uh, oh, and, so, and, and sorry, also Claire, Claire Asquith uh, was going to come. Uh, she gave a wonderful talk a, a little bit earlier. Yeah. She's, she's uh, we, we had a long discussion. She actually looks after a 90-year-old mother, and we decided it was far better that, uh, that she stays where she is and doesn't, doesn't uh, mix too, too much. Um, because of because of the age of her mother, really, so uh, so she she's not here, and again she sends her she sends her apologies. Uh, we have on the panel uh, the Archbishop uh, Rowan, uh, you all know, and we're going to give a, another introduction to him uh, uh, later uh, later on before his before his lecture. Paul Edmondson, uh, uh, who gave a talk on uh, Shakespeare and spirituality uh, earlier in the earlier in the se in the season. Uh, and, and Yvette Carey, uh, who gave a, a wonderful talk on uh, nuns and friars. Or was it friars and nuns? Because I always get it wrong. Um, so nuns. <laughs> it was nuns and friars um, early, early in the season. And uh, those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Mike Scott. I'm a fellow here at, uh, at Black Friars and the Senior Dean. So I'm going to start off, the, uh, I'm going to start off by asking each of you, and I'll start with Paul, yeah, if I may, Paul. Uh, but it's the same question. What, what do you think um, the Christian culture and environment, what contribution do you think that, that made on Shakespeare's, on Shakespeare's plays? Thank you, Mike, and thanks very much for inviting me to be part of the panel. Um, well, I, I, as, we've, as we've heard during the lecture series, to talk about Shakespeare and religion in any way um, is to be political and to think about the political climate of his time. And this was particularly the case in Claire Asquith's paper, and I'm sure she would say that if she was, if she was here, um, and how, as it were, the trauma of the Reformation was, was coped with when bodied forth through Shakespeare's imagination on the early modern stages. Um, I mean, I think what we haven't heard very much of, and I think we'll be hearing it more from Rowan um, this evening, um, is, is the Bible as a source for Shakespeare and the Book of Common Prayer as a source for Shakespeare. These were the Christian resources available to him that he could freely use uh, carefully. Um, and of course, the Bible does saturate his work. Um, when, I, when I spoke um, and when I think about Shakespeare and Christianity, um, I, I see him primarily always as a very generous writer. And so when I think about him as myself as a Christian reader and, and a priest in the Anglican church, um, I sort of want to let everything in. So, so Shakespeare as um, incarnating as an artist and Shakespeare's bodying forth 
and the power of the imagination to change um, people and to create new worlds um, is very important to me. Um, so Shakespeare, I think, can become a site of spiritual reflection. Um, and, and what that looks like in our different Christian traditions then becomes very interesting. Um, so I think, you know, it's good to ask, well, what is there? Where did it come from? What does it tell us? What might we do with it and why? Um, I'll, I'll pause there for now. OK, thank you. Yvette? Um, well, thank you very much, Mike. Um, for me, um, I focus more on the nuns and friars, which are more associated, obviously, with the Catholic side of um, religion, of, of Christianity. Um, and I was curious as to um, why and how did he portray these characters, these, um, I want to say characters, but um, these roles uh, within the play, uh, within the plays, within the canon, uh, at a time where um, the country was a Protestant country. So, and I delve in um, closer into um, the uh, where they are portrayed. It's easy to say, for example, or was easy to dismiss at first, to say, well, if, uh, if a play is set in Italy, for example, or in a Catholic um, environment, then they would have those um, characters, nuns and friars. But what was more curious, I think, is um, even in a, in a setting where, um, a pagan setting, you had um, at least the nuns uh, part uh, playing a big part. And these nuns didn't seem to me uh, to be pagan nuns. I think they were more Christian nuns. Uh, for example, in the um, uh, Comedy of Errors is the prioress, which comes in and takes over, or if you like, connects all the loose ends, and there's so many loose ends in that play. Um, and it is um, it was a tradition in Shakespeare's time, more in the Elizabethan than in the Jacobean, to have um, the body of the church, somebody representing the church, come in and kind of create some sort of calm and peace after the chaotic um, plots that go on. So that that was my uh, my um, interest in how they are um, portrayed. Uh, the friars were much more um, uh, well. A, a big range of how they played, and so, most of those were in a Catholic setting, in Romeo and Juliet, for example. Um, whereas nuns in the Hamlet, for instance, and even in Midsummer Night's Dream, they were asexual. So it's all about sexuality of the female um, clergy. Uh, whereas for the friars, it's more how much can they contribute to um, the ordinary people's life, uh, doing the ministries, for example, and so on. So that, that, that's where I um, started my curiosity. Fine. Rowan, would you like to just have a go at this, this question mm. first, if, I, if I'm not impinging on your lecture, but, you yeah, know, this, this to come. No, well, I, I hope that there'll be things in the lecture which will be relevant to this, but let me echo the thanks that have already been expressed to um, all those who have made this possible. I've been looking forward enormously to this evening, this conversation. I'd go along with what Paul said very strongly, that, of course, it's, it's a political environment, and part of the political heritage, I think divides into two themes which recur in the plays as both political and spiritual questions. There's what you might call the generational trauma. There's a lot in Shakespeare about generational conflict. And I ask myself how much that has to do with the sense of generational rupture just before Shakespeare's lifetime, that the entire society has been through a period of visible breakage. And I don't think we can underrate the significance in the Tudor and early Stuart imaginary, a 
of the fact that you are literally living in the presence of ruins in very many contexts. And I sense that sometimes. It, of course, it's there in the sonnets, the bare ruined choirs, etc. Um, that's one theme. And the other is connected with it, and it's about legitimacy. Shakespeare writes a lot about kingship and what authentic kingship is and isn't. And that's not just, in our sense, a narrowly political question. I think it's a question about sacred authority and what happens when sacred authority is challenged or fractured. And it's as if Shakespeare pushes the question back beyond just the immediate mid to late 16th century context, almost saying it all starts with Richard II. <laughs> that's, that's where the worm gets into the, the system. Um, and yet the revolt against Richard's authority in Richard II is not just an upsurge of anarchy, it's a holding to account of a sacred monarchy that's become corrupt and self-serving. So he plays with those tensions throughout the history plays and in other contexts as well. What is true authority? What is true kingship? And part of his answer, indirectly in the long run, hinted at in bits of Lear as well as elsewhere, is, well, what if authentic royal authority has something to do with a genuine immersion in the life and the sufferings of a populace? What if there's an incarnational model for true authority? So I think those, those two aspects of Shakespeare looking at his own social and historical world may, may help us a bit into this question as well, quite apart from the obvious ways in which he addresses again and again issues of reconciliation at its cost, issues of promise and integrity, about which I'll say a bit more in the talk this evening, obvious Christianly inflected themes, and this is not even to touch on <coughs> what Paul's already mentioned, the simple verbal echoes all mm. over the place mm. of the language of the Geneva Bible and the Book of Common Prayer. Thank you very much. I, uh, I'll come back to the panel um, on, on, on some of these issues. Uh, it seems, uh, seems to me that something that resonated when you, when you spoke, spoke well and then goes back to the very first lecture, not in this, uh, not in the Christian Shakespeare series, uh, but the first lecture in the Future of the Humanities project, uh, which was given by Terry Eagleton. And he was talking about um, the, the, the necessity to come to terms and to accept that you're moving to death in order to find new horizons. And it was only through that, through that movement uh, to death that, you, that new horizons, horizons could come. And, and, uh, and then he, he linked that in with... Uh, uh, said that actually that, that that is an aspect of struggle uh, which uh, which is is manifest in in Christianity manifest in psychoanalysis manifest also he, he said in in Marxism and, and that that leads I think to a, a, a kind of question here about uh, Shakespeare's huge preoccupation with death um, in, all, in, in all the plays, it seems to me, or in the vast majority of the plays, most of the comedies begin with a threat of death of some kind or other. And, and, and the movement is, uh, is, is, is one to get to some kind of new beginnings, to get over, that, uh, to get over the hor horizon. Whereas when, when, you, when we have a look at the, uh, at the tragedies, uh, in, in two of the tragedies, of course, um, we start, we're starting with death uh, in Hamlet, in Hamlet and Macbeth. But as far as Othello uh, is, is concerned, and as far as King Lear is concerned, actually the starts are about new beginnings 
which actually are not new beginnings. They're not going to take you because you've still got to go through the struggle of the tragedy to get to that's something. But you know, the, the king is retiring. He's going to have a, he's going to have a, new, be, a new beginning. I know exactly that feeling because I retired once <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then the Dominicans moved in. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, I know, know that about, uh, 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 about that, you know. And uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the, the um, well, uh, let, let's just say about Othello. For him, it's, it's a new beginning as well, isn't it? It's, he's, he's going to get married. He's wooed her, he's going to get married. He doesn't know what that's going to lead to, that new beginning. And he's got to go through that huge problem and, and, uh, to, uh, to death um, and the struggle. And then where we're left with the, uh, with, with the notion of tragedy. So mm -hmm. over to other members of the yeah, panel. Yeah, well, uh, following on from that, Mike, I'd wish to remind us of the many resurrection moments in Shakespeare's plays. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for example, the comedy of errors has already been mentioned, and we might see that as a sort of resurrection narrative. Certainly, it's a narrative of reconciliation, family reunion at the end. But, but um, you know, the, the twins, who are the two sets of identical twins, who, re, uh, who are reunited to each other and to their parents, and the parents to both sets of identical twins, you know, they didn't know they were all still alive until the end of that play. Correct. Um, and then in Much Ado About Nothing, you have Hero, whose death is actually, as it were, faked, who comes back to life in narrative terms to Claudio, who spurned her, give not this rotten orange royal friend at the point of, of, of marriage in, in, in front of the, the friar. Um, and then you have Viola and Sebastian in Twelfth Night, who both think that each other is drowned. Okay. Uh, until they're reunited at the end and they've come back to life to each other as brother and sister. Do I stand there? I never had a brother, nor have I that deity in my nature of here, than ev and, of here and everywhere. And, and, they, and they welcome each other back to life. Yeah. And then when you, my goodness, when you get measure for measure, Isabella supposes Claudio is dead and then he comes back to life for her. Um, and then by the time you get to Cymbeline, Imogen thinks that Posthumus is dead and he comes back to life for her. And Pericles thinks his wife has died and Thaisa comes back to life for Pericles. And then of course the winter's tale, oh my goodness, mm. is as it were the crescendo of, of all, the, all the resurrection narratives audience I've been writing about for years and which I know you love are now coming together in this kind of <laughs> Ninth Symphony, if you like, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 uh, of, uh, or a, a Sistine Chapel ceiling of a play, The Winter's Tale, yeah. uh, with, the, with the coming back to life of, of Hermione, whom everyone is supposed to be, is supposed to, be have, 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 to have died 16 years ago, and she comes to life as a statue at the end. Um, so so that, that's very important if I think about new directions of Shakespeare. I'd also say, I know the, the series is, is premised on Shakespeare and Christianity and Shakespeare and religion, but there's, there, there's, there's many ways in which Shakespeare now in Shakespeare studies is being construed and being um, read as a secularising author. Um, and that his project is not an overtly religious one, partly because it couldn't be overtly religious because of the times, and we think to the to the to the, to the political questions there. Um, but you know, um, I my question to the room, my question to the panel, and for us to go away with one of the questions I'd wish to ask is, you know, why isn't Shakespeare in our lectionary as a named person on the twenty third of April? I'd love him to be. St George is there, and we could have William Shakespeare in small print underneath, because you know George Herbert is in there, and and John Donne is in there, and and other great writers of the Christian tradition. Why isn't Shakespeare? Well, he's not primarily a Christian teacher. That's not his project. So so what we read into the plays is our project as Christian readers and as, as it were, Christian historians, looking at the period and thinking, well, you know, let's think about Shakespeare through a religious lens. I think he is a great Christian questioner, and I think that's one of the reasons why he should be in the lectionary, because he teaches us how to doubt in his plays, um, which is not the same as him not having faith. The opposite to faith is certainty, it's certainly not doubt. 
doubt is a doubt is a good thing, and I think Shakespeare embodies um, forth doubt um, within his Christian context, and that I think is a very life giving thing for for a Christian audience, Christian reader of Shakespeare's plays. But I I, I think we must admit and um, acknowledge that he's primarily a theatrical entrepreneur and a professional writer who is you know wanting to make his his living and and by all accounts and our records in Stratford prove this um he he did so very thoroughly <laughs> um, yeah. with his with his freehold investments and, and the money he, the money he was making from the writing of these plays through the company through the shares in the company and the shares in the theater well the fact uh, the, the fact on on that is of course that the um what what we have are two companies that are that are set up, you know, and you've got an internal and you get internal markets uh, mm. occurring as well, you know. I mean, you know, as you probably know, I start one of my books on Shakespeare's comedies with the uh, with the phrase Shakespeare was a businessman, mm. you know, and and he cer he certainly was, but I think what you're talking about is also this the fact that he is he's working within a, an ambience of a, of of amazing. Things going on within Christianity um, that that naturally are percolating into into what he is saying as well, and and, and really Christianity it is shameful of what of what was going on, you know, that whether with depending on 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 the on the on the monarch, Protestants uh, ex, ex, executing Catholics or Catholics executing Protestants in the most horrific way. Mm. Not just in not just in our country, but in other countries in other countries as well. You know, it, in in a sense, for 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 Christianity, it's it's a it's a time of shame, really, because if love is the central element of Christianity, there wasn't much love being shown, you know, to your enemies at at, at that time, for political reasons and and all and all of that. But it's cer certainly percolating through. Mm -hmm. So would you act, and if I go to one more to Yvette. Then to Owen, and then I'll open it up to, oh, to the audience. Yeah, yeah, that, um, that's fine. I, I totally agree with the fact, uh, not so much just a businessman. He was a dramatist. Mm -hmm. He wanted to create drama. And when you look at sometimes at the sources, for example, Antony Cleopatra, you can put his source side by side and you can easily tell that he's just picked that from this and, and put it in that particular context. Now, he wasn't a preacher as such, but Christianity was part of the everyday life. They all had to go to, to church. If you didn't go to church, you got penalized. So, uh, and, and the Bible was um, uh, readily available, the, the book of prayer, everybody knew. So whatever language he uses is what was going on. So he picked what he wanted from all the sources, not only the Bible, not only the, uh, the Book of Prayers. But I would go even further with the, with the um, idea of a dramatist. And I mention Anton Cleopatra again, because Cleopatra is a difficult role to play. Most actors can play one side of her, but they fail to play the other. They can play the flirtatious, but when it comes to the um, ruler, they, they struggle. Very few actors can pull both parts. So he had to work with what's available. So he must have had a brilliant boy who could play Cleopatra. Otherwise, he wouldn't have written that <laughs> difficult, complicated um, character. So, but... Um, and, and then if I go back to the nuns and friars, so the, the, the friars that he picked, he picked the friars, not the intellectual ones, not the ones who are going to be um, highbrow, if you like, or be too taxing for, for, for his audience. He picked friars who were readily available, who can mix with them, who can uh, get to know their everyday life. So I think he, he, he used his sources but he also used whatever was in the company available to him to, to characterise these people. Thanks very much. Mm. Just partly in response to uh, Paul's question about the lectionary. Oh, yes. um, when 
um, an anthology of Anglican spiritual writing was produced some years ago called Love's Redeeming Work. Shakespeare was included in that. So not quite the lectionary, but just a, a, sh a shade of it's that. It's a very encouraging thought. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, the, the point that both Yvette and um, Paul have made is absolutely key. Shakespeare is a writer and he seeks to be a good writer, not a propagandist, not a preacher, but someone who thinks by writing. Uh -huh. And thinking back to Flannery O'Connor's remarks about art and faith, she's very clear that if you set out to write a good Catholic novel, you will write a very bad novel indeed. <laughs> if you're a good novelist who happens to be a Catholic, there's a chance you might write a good novel. Similarly with Shakespeare. He, to use a phrase I'll come back to in a moment, he uses Christianity to think with, undoubtedly. And that's a phrase which comes from, I think, Philip Henscher's review of Marilyn Robinson's Gilead, where he says that for the first time he begins to understand how Christianity might be serious enough to think with. Now, quite clearly, if you live in a theologically saturated culture like Elizabethan and Jacobean England, that is part of what you will think with. Hmm. And it's clear to me that that's what he's doing. And it doesn't mean that he's arguing a theological case. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's um, constructing a set of cryptograms with theological subtexts. It does mean that he is, in his mind, as it were, bouncing backwards and forwards between um, a furnished theological room and the conversations you might have within it with those images sort of impinging on your imagination as, as you go forward. And that, to me, is the real interest of Christianity and Shakespeare. It's, it's somebody thinking human conversation, the human situation, human conflict, human reconciliation, with all of that, yes, as the hangings on the wall. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, let me, uh, let me open, open it up. Um, and keep your questions relatively short so that we can uh, make sure we get, it, get, get a good debate. Any, any questions on what we've, what we've heard so far? Yes, I think that's a, a that's that's an interest, an interesting point. That, um, and if you have a look at, uh, for example, if we have a look at the, the the very final speech, uh, the epilogue of the Tempest. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Let speak about. Let, that. Would you like to speak about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hadn't queued that one in. That's I was delighted. What, what do you think about the Tempest and uh, what's being said? Oh well, I have, yes, I've got a whole lecture on that one. But, um, I, spot on, I think. That's exactly what I think he's doing. And what I've sometimes imagined him thinking about what he's doing is answering the question, so we don't have now an absolutely secure and fixed public Catholic imaginary, social imaginary. We've got the ruins and the fragments of it. So we can't just stay to the mystery plays again. But what do the mystery, the medieval mystery plays do they tell you who you are in, in theatre, in public, declamatory, semi-ritual form. And I, I sort of imagine Shakespeare thinking, what if I had a go at telling people who they are, not just by repeating the liturgical and scriptural story, but by reworking the human story itself with that in mind? I, I agree, it's not secularising, it's quite the opposite. Mm. But as, as for The Tempest, well, I think that that last speech is almost endlessly fertile as you try to think what, what it's about. And it seems to me something to do with the, uh, I mean, it's a cliche to the, the dramatist steps forward, it's not the case, but you know, Prospero, standing forward at the end, Prospero, the controlling scriptwriter, 
for his island, stepping forward and saying, well, this is what dramatists do. But if what dramatists do is going to be any use at all, you've got to be involved. Mm. So when you put your hands together, as we say, don't do it just to applaud. There was in the, I, I was watching, uh, watching the film The Two Popes, which I've seen twice now, and they're terrific. And there's, there's, uh, there's one moment when Benedict is um, making his uh, almost confession to, uh, to Francis, and he says that he was too much in his books to remember the, some of the duties that he had to do, which seems to me goes back, <laughs> back to a very Tempest kind of thing from, from, Prosper, from, from Prospero's mm. point of view. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the Tempest also is one of those that starts very badly indeed. I mean, it starts with a Tempest, and you think um, uh, it's, it's going to be disaster all the way through, and there is a resurrection, huh? They, yes, they, Alonso, they Alonso yes. thinks his son has died, Ferdinand. Yeah, gets but him back. E even the brothers gets back, get yeah. back together. But here, I think, is because of the genre. The genre he is a comedy. He decided it's going to be a comedy, and that's why there's reconciliation in the end. Um, but if if there was a tragedy, but it could have easily gone the other way. So mm. th there's an issue of balancing, if you like. How much do I give people? How how can I manipulate them? <laughs> how much can I make him laugh and how much can I make him cry? Yeah. Paul, do you, any comments on this? On The Tempest yeah. especially. <laughs> well, I'm seeing it tomorrow evening with Michael Pennington as Prospero, unless it's cancelled because of corona. Oh, it's, right. just, it's just opened at the German Street Theatre a uh, little studio space and, you know, for those of us who know and, and, and like Michael Pennington's performances, yeah, yeah. it's absolutely right he should be playing Prospero. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just add the footnote, um, and because uh, Rowan mentioned, uh, as it were, Shakespeare as Prospero, and it, one doesn't have to go down that route, I know, and indeed we didn't in Shakespearean biography until the 19th century, mm -hmm. surprisingly, mm -hmm. surprisingly. Um, but the grave, the epitaph in Stratford, if we're looking for biographical connections, it's interesting, isn't it, that the dramatist of the island who steps forward and gives away power and, you know, and my ending is despair unless I be relieved by prayer, um, is the same meter, tetrameter, not pentameter, which is a little unusual for Shakespeare, he does it elsewhere, but it's there at the end of the Tempest, it means something specially by it, um, is the same metre as on, on the grave in Stratford in, and in rhyming couplets. Um, so if one's going for, as it were, poetic connections and biographical ones, then it seems to me that's a very strong one to make between Prospero's final speech and the rhythm and the poise <laughs> of um, Shakespeare's epitaph on his grave, uh, which may lend weight um, to the view that he wrote his own epitaph. Um, we don't know who wrote it, but we know that he wrote epitaphs for other people, um, so it's not unlikely. Yeah, very good. Question, please. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, I'm going to be very dull because that's the first speech I learned. Uh, um, the quality of mercy. I, I don't know. Um, it's a tough one. I don't know. It's a good it's, one, though, isn't it? It's yeah, yeah, because it's tough. Yeah. It's good. Um, I can't think of anyone better than the quality of mercy from the Christian point of view um, for the um, for the moment. Um, no. Well, I, my vote is for what Isabella says to Angelo in Measure for Measure. Yes. Why all the sills that were were forfeit once, and he that might advantage best have took found out the remedy. That, to me, is the most, perhaps the most overtly theological thing Shakespeare ever wrote in any of his plays. But in terms of which play most crystallises for me, something of the, the theological undertow, I, I guess it might well be, uh, might well be Pericles, strangely, mm. because that, the sheer 
almost anarchic quality of that restoration and reconciliation. It, it's such a bizarre play, of course, it's not just Shakespeare. But um, I've often felt watching Pericles moved beyond my expectations. Bearing in mind the, the chaos, uh, an, an arc, uh, Anarchy that I think it was a phrase you used with relation to Pericles. Was it chaos or anarchy that you said? Anarchy, I think. Anarchy, <laughs> anarchic nature of the play. And, you know, as it were, separated by the sea and everything. Um, I, I'd go into the forest because I think mm. that's very important for Shakespeare and his dramatic construction. So I'd, I'd choose uh, As You Like It um, and I would look to the great speech by Duke Senior at the mm. beginning of Act Two to his co-mates in exile, banished in the forest of Arden, uh, which ends, um, this our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. And then there's an exchange between um, Duke Senior and one of the Lord's Amiens, and Amien says, happy is your grace that can exchange the stubbornness of exile into so blessed and sweet a style. Um, and, and that's why the play is called As You Like It, that it's what we bring to our, our feelings of adversity and our feelings of exile. And Christianity enables us to do that. It, it, it empowers us to go out into the world and to change the world um, with the Holy Spirit. And, and I see that in that exchange in As You Like It, and I see the um, incarnation um, in the words of the Duke, sermons in stones, books in the running brooks, tongues in trees, that the, the, the natural world and our harmony with it is, is, is part of our relationship um, to the divine. Well, uh... I, I would actually point to uh, go back to Richard II and uh, the great speech, let's sit upon the ground, tell sad stories of the death of kings. Because as that speech develops, you realise that it's not just about the death of kings. That speech is an everyman speech. It's about us. Yeah. It's about us. Mm. And, uh, and all our expectations of what we think of ourselves where we are, and with a little pin, death pours through that, mm. that castle wall, and farewell, King, it's farewell, everybody. And it's confronting us with this, uh, this whole issue, which I started off with, about, about Shakespeare and death, and can you, move beyond, can you move beyond that? And so he's questioning, I think, uh, questioning us. Right in the early on, 1595, he's questioning us on this, and he's coming to the resurrections, he's coming to, the, mm. to these things, you know. So I said just one thing about the winter's tale. Ah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was just very, one. <laughs> I, I was, I was very, yeah, it's just an anecdote, uh, while somebody else is thinking of a question. It's just an anecdote, but um, uh, I was very fortunate, I, I, I don't mind ever saying this, that I wasn't doing very well at school, I was getting myself into a lot of trouble, and, uh, and, I, I went to, uh, I, I, my aunt took me to Stratford, you know, and I saw um, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the, I saw Richard II actually, as the, fir as, uh, as the first, uh, first one with, uh, just on the next. Pasco Richard No, no, before that. Oh, oh I'm older before then. I'm older than you. <laughs> I'm older than you. <laughs> Play David Warner. David, David Warner. Warner. David Warner's Richard II. Um, uh, and then the following year, I saw I saw his great Hamlet, you know. And uh, uh, but that that Richard II changed my life. It was it was like St Paul, you know. It was just com uh, a complete change of life. Anyway, I, I I went I started to go and go and go and go through the go through the uh, go through the plays, and it came to uh, the Winter's Tale was on, uh, and it was with, uh, with Judy it was with Judy uh, Dench playing uh, Perdita and High Money, yes. and. Uh, and as we were going, I didn't know the play. Uh, and I just said, to, and my, my mother was there, and I said, what is it? She said, I'm not going to tell you this play. I'm not going to tell you the story of, of this play, you know. And it was quite, quite remarkable just seeing it without knowing it 
at all. And, and it was one of the great, great productions, you know. It was just a, fab, a fabulous production. The, the revelation at the end, you know, that she's alive. It's just incredible. The, the magic of theatre on that. Any more questions, please? I just read this morning an excellent review of Rowan's book, Luminaries, um, which is in this week's TLS. Have you seen it yet? I've got, I've got a copy here if you need. <laughs> <laughs> and just to summarise, so um, Ro a, a recent book by Rowan, um, not the latest book, but the recent book is called Luminaries. Um, and the review says um, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's an anthology of, of talks about, about great Christian lives. So, for example, in Rowan's book, we learn about um, St Alban on, wel on welcoming the stranger, William Tyndale on community, William Wilberforce against slavery, Dickens on what hell is like, Meister Eckhart on what God is, Saint Teresa on what prayer is for, Saint Augustine of Hippo on being honest with ourselves, Sergei Bulgakov, Edith Stein, Simone Weil, Oscar Romero, on faith in relation to its own political moment. And so that question you've just asked seems to me, well, what would we say of Shakespeare? Shakespeare on what? What does Shakespeare show us if we were to add him to luminaries, if you were to write the difficult second album? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, <laughs> you know, what would you, what would you say about, mm. about Shakespeare? You've mentioned, you mentioned human conflict, reconciliation, human thought in answer to a previous question. I would add human generosity and human doubt in terms of, you know, relationship to God in Shakespeare. I don't know what others would add. Mm. Um, it's, it's a very tricky question and, uh, and a very interesting one. I suppose one reason for my going for that particular uh, speech from Measure for Measure is that that says something about God. It says something about generosity. Mm. All the souls that were were forfeit ones, and he that might advantage best have took found out the remedy. And it feeds into this whole question which recurs so much in Shakespeare. What does legitimate power look like? Perhaps it looks like that. It looks like renouncing advantage to find a remedy. And perhaps that's one thing that Shakespeare says about God, if you, if you want to push that question. Here is a story of the supreme, unique advantage which finds healing. And that, that's a kind of touchstone for not just human power, but human action itself. So maybe that, that's a way in. I don't know. I'd have to think more about it, though. Okay. I don't think Question I'm qualified it. to answer Question that. It. Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. It's a blessing. It's a blessing and a curse, and it's a prayer. It's for Jesus' sake, and when we read it, we become Shakespeare's friend, good friend. Good. Thank you. Mm. Yes, I, I, I think that's right. And doesn't it relate to? the point made in the first question about the way in which, if you like, the ordinary is suffused with something mm. because of what Shakespeare does. And to me, that's also reflected in some of the ways in which many of the most potent moments in Shakespeare are very deliberately cast in almost a sort of anti-rhetoric, monosyllables, mm -hmm. short, very sort of loaded words. Oh, she's warm. I mean, is there a, a line in the whole of English literature quite like that? And that's, I think, not unconnected with what, what you're saying. OK, thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll just take a five-minute break now, please, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then Rowan will, uh, will be talking to us about The Merchant of Venice. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think... <laughs>